Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Rory. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about testing grounds and the quarry today or tonight. I thought a good way to start this, uh, given Rory's ambitions for this series, was to basically just really simply talk you through three projects. I could probably talk about any one of these projects for hours. So to keep this to a sort of a short time frame, I thought it'd be really good to just to spend, and given the, the sort of your, your context um, in sort of coming to the end of your architecture, um, education and, and maybe coming into uh, practice, <clears throat> I thought I'd just really simply take you through the site for each project and its context. Uh, then sort of how we responded to the brief. And I guess that's, um, in, in, with a bit of hindsight and looking back at my practice, I guess it, that's the moment where our work moved away from, I guess, conventional practice is sort of how we challenged or responded to the brief. And then, as I said, with a bit of hindsight, I'll just kind of share a few reflections. I guess the first thing I'd just like to say, though, uh, which is, is, is really important, is all the work that we do is on um, traditional lands and the two projects in the city are on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people and our project in the quarry is on the traditional lands of the Gadabanu people. And it's through our practice, it's through every facet of our practice that we really strive to, to, to um, be grateful for this, I guess, what I like to think about as a shared connection through these places to what's the oldest continuing living culture on earth. And I think that's something we can all be really, really proud of and really embrace in every facet of our practice. So through, whether it's through research, whether it's through professional practice, whatever aspect, whatever way you're working, I think that's a really nice thing to just, to just keep close. So uh, testing grounds started, as Rory said, in the arts precinct, a little, little triangle of site. Tri triangle of land. This was 2013. This was post GFC, which is probably before a lot of everyone's time. But this is a time when local government or state governments were looking for activation ideas for, for, for parts of the city that were sort of struggling. So as I, in the context of the arts precinct site, we were asked by Creative Victoria um, at the time what we might do with this site. And this was, um, this was me, two years out of architecture school, uh, not really liking commercial practice, but doing it, sort of um, getting a bit frustrated by bathrooms and, and kitchen fit outs and wondering what it was all about and doing a few things on the side with my partner at the time. Oh, my, my partner now <laughs> at the time. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so we were kind of, he's, he came from lighting, a lighting and theatre background and we were just doing stuff in public because that's actually what we wanted to do. So we got asked by um, Creative Victoria to, to think about something. What would we do if they gave us this site for 24 hours? This is the site. There's my darling Kelpie who's no longer with us. Her name was Sunday. Um, so this was the site. So you, hopefully this is kind of locating you all where behind Inga King's um, waves there. This is all now a huge construction site as part of the redevelopment. But we were given this site and asked what we'd do with it for 24 hours. And we responded with a 24 month program. And they laughed at us and told us to go away. And then three months later, <laughs> they called us back and they're like, um, okay, so we don't know what else to do with the site. Uh, let's talk, let's maybe think about a 12 month or a six month program. So what happened then was, very little budget, as I said, post-GFC, um, post governments were sort of scrambling to do things but weren't sure what to do. So the mechanism really for us and the way we kind of expanded this brief was by talking really closely to our, um, I guess, I, I like to call them collaborators, the people we work with, I guess conventionally they'd be called clients, but uh, we talked really like a lot of chats at the time about, well, what money do you have? They don't have any programming money. Programming money is really hard to come by. So we looked at the maintenance budget that they had, that they were already spending on this site, which was not inconsiderable for managing graffiti and managing, this is not, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and so we took the maintenance budget and we set up on that site literally in their, according to their spreadsheets as the caretakers. And we um, had a program of basically open access. So what that meant was we thought about this site as the back rooms or the, or the, 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 the workshop of the arts precinct at the time. And we all know arts precincts are really geared towards an audience-based participation. We're really interested in saying, we don't care about the audience. We want to make a space for artists, for emerging artists, for people who would never get invited to the arts precinct to do anything. We want to be the backyard for them. And so that, um, that kind of began this strange project where we were there every day, we were opening the gates. We moved out of our comfy little kind of studio in Collingwood and we moved into a shipping container in, on City Road. 
and these are a whole lot of photos <laughs> of that. So it went through um, it went through a couple of iterations. The the sort of there was this palette palette moment here where it was really trying to sort of sort of be um, unthreatening to the neighbours and and be something that was sort of familiar. This kind of I guess pop up temporary thing. Don't worry, it's all a bit weird, but it's not going to be there for very long. That was I guess the the narrative. After a while, um, our six month contract we were sort of three years in and. Creative Victoria, sort of a change of governments. We went from a um, um, Creative Victoria went from a Conservative government in in um, 2013 to um, back to a Labor government in 2015 or 2014, and uh, and they were really interested in investing in this project. The kind of the proof of concept had happened in that first phase, and I guess that's an interesting thing to think about projects that iterate and um, and continue for and and go through I guess different phases of experimentation. So we um, thought long and hard, but it was pretty obvious we didn't, we didn't actually take long to design this because we'd sat there for three years with artists and with students and had a million questions about things, questions like, can I run power from one side of the site to the other? Can I hang from that? Can I move all these things over there? And, and, and I guess our attitude was also always one of saying yes, yes, if we can work out something. Or, you know, always a yes, if, not a, a no, because. So we came back with this approach in 2016 with, um, with more funding from Creative Victoria to sort of, um, sort of produce what we call um, creative infrastructure, uh, or we call this sort of this superstructure. And the idea was, there's lots of reasons, and I, I won't, I'll run out of time, but basically this was an offering. This was a, a moment in time where we said, we don't want architecture on this site, we want infrastructure, because infrastructure is a generous, um, a generous host that gets out of the way and... I guess um, foregrounds the activity rather than the rather than the built form. It's um, all temporary, in terms of pushing the the brief and and, and pushing the kind of parameters. There were um, you know there was this idea originally of the caretakers budget. We were able to work. There's always seems to be a, a willing building surveyor in the room, and so these were um, clusters. Um, uh, class ten, so um, carports or garages with um, big open doors. So this was all really inexpensive and it was all designed to be able to move. And Rory mentioned, which I'm not gonna talk about today because it's a whole other chapter, but we have moved this project in the past couple of months. So creative infrastructure, I guess, is what we're talking about. Um, and that being a sort of, a, yeah, a, 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 some, something in that that is about generosity and it's about getting out of the way. And it's also about clearing a space for others. So details are really simple. It all unbolts, um, it all goes on the back of a truck and it all goes on. So this is a kind of like a sexy architecture photo and that's not at all what it looked like at the end. <laughs> um, but I guess, yeah, something about um, just really simple, simple structures that then lots of stuff happened in. What also happened was there was a kit of parts. So you see here these hanging frames, they're hanging, and they're also down here, hanging frames, plinths, all these kind of outdoor bits of furniture that could be sort of loosely interpreted. I guess we always, I always show this photo because it's kind of like we literally had this strange block of land in the arts precinct and no one cared what we did. It was completely bonkers. We would light fires. We would let off firecrackers. People that were doing stuff in the arts centre that couldn't do stuff, couldn't um, like do stuff there would come and like use us as their weird backyard. This was an activity called smashing things with hammers that was really popular on Friday afternoons in the arts precinct. Um, so yeah, so I guess this is just a, a lovely little summary of lots of things that were done to this site. And I guess there's something about this project that, I guess there's something about all our work in, and it, I guess, goes, pushes a little bit against the conventions of architecture in that when you hand over a project to a client or to someone else, that's for, a, from an architect's perspective, that's of, often the end. So that's maybe the last time you'll see the project or that's sort of as it was imagined and that's how it will always stay in your mind. When I look back at those original, that original photo of the sort of superstructure from above, it's not at all how I remember it. I sort of remember it like this and, and um, hopefully it's in a lot of people's memories like this. This is Jaffle Symposium. So we had Saturday morning Jaffle sessions where we would have conversations about art around about, while making Jaffles. And um, yeah, and just also this kind of idea of, I guess, we would say yes. So if someone wanted to do something for 24 hours, if someone, we had people living there and, and doing things, we had sort of a whole lot of stuff happen. And our, it, it might be sort of, I guess you could think about it like an arts project, but um, I guess we really think about it as a creative infrastructure project. And I guess I would think about it more as, um, yeah, a, 
a platform more than a program. Okay, so project two. <laughs> Um, so SiteWorks is in Brunswick. This is a um, local council um, project. This is the little, the little white thing there. Um, we've got, just to locate everyone, that's Brunswick Baths, it's Dawson Street, Sydney Road. So this is an old school. So just to kind of go back to my narrative of like the site, the context, um, this is an old school that um, Mary Beck Council purchased about uh, 10 years ago. It was originally a, a, a house that belonged to the mayor of Brunswick at the time, who, um, long story there, I won't go into that, but a uh, school purchased by Mary Beck, they didn't know what to do with it. They had reports coming back from building surveys that they weren't going to be able to access the building. So we originally, our original brief here was to occupy the grounds, the outside grounds, for 20 hours a week. Um, we were, so we had this large asset, we had this building, we didn't have any funding from Mary Beck Council, but the building was the kind of the mechanism for funding the project. So we really quickly realised we had to get access to this building. Uh, and it was really important in that, in that place in Brunswick with um, the arts community and the, the sort of the creative sector around us and the creative sector, at the, and it sort of still is getting squeezed a bit by a lot of residential developments happening in Brunswick. We saw this as a really important asset to, to get access to. So the first thing, another, once again, a really um, great collaboration with a building surveyor who really just sort of pointed out, if you demonstrate what's called continued use, there's no requirement to change any, any um, use of the building and no requirement to upgrade the building significantly to change use. So it was a school. So that very quickly defined the project for us as running an education space. And then it's a really interesting conversation to think about well, what is education? What is... What, you, what, what is it if it's not the formal, we're not, we're not a university, we're not planning to set up a university, so it's learning and it's exchange and it's, it's people coming together and doing stuff. So we're like, good, we can do this. The only thing we needed to do was change the, um, uh, change the add these to narrow the width, sorry, every second one, and add this here, it's here. So this was basically um, giving us access to the building. And now the, the other thing, I guess, just to show the mechanism, I guess, for this project was at the time, as I said, this project didn't have any funding, but we had space. So we, um, in the really early days, we set up what we called a contra program where we would exchange space for skills. And the first person we brought into this project was a steel welder and a steel designer. And um, Dale Holden stayed really close to this project for the whole, the whole time. And uh, so the first person we got in and the first space was put over to a steel workshop and the first piece of work he did here was to enable access to that site. So I guess the kind of in hindsight, the really important things about this project were this sort of access, providing access, managing access, and also this notion of exchange. Um, this is the old signage of the school, so it was also sort of signalling that there was a shift, but we weren't entirely sure what was happening yet. So going back to that idea about testing grounds is like the first, the first day with this project is really the beginning of the project for us. It's not the end. When, it's, when we finally open the doors, it's the very beginning. So we started signalling. This kind of is seen just from Sydney Road, this signage. We started sort of signalling. We're not too sure what we are yet, and we're not going to sort of announce it to too boldly, but we're going to try and suggest to the community that there's things happening here and, and with that there's an invitation to, to, to come and get access. So, buildings for high, so spaces for hire essentially. Um, and I always show this because this was um, my kid. We used, to scribble, we used to put um, posters up in the corridors and my kid would always draw all over them. So we just embraced it. Um, but yeah, and then I guess in a similar way to testing grounds, there was, I guess, a an invitation for use, for low cost use, and, um, and uh, I guess an invitation there and, a, and, a, and an obligation from us that opening doors is a privilege. And it's not a, it's not, you know, I think often people with keys around their necks will often um, try and keep doors closed. But I guess the ethos of our practice is to, we're fortunate enough to have these opportunities and sharing them is, is vital to their success and, and their sustainability. More fires, we love fires. <laughs> um, I guess also just coming in here, um, just education. So without, without sort of um, determining this, or but what we've really learned is that our spaces and that what we try and do really does marry well with, with um, experimentation and um, studios, we run, like heaps of design studios get run through these sites. Um, and also a really big arts community embraced this site, which was never part of the plan. 
but it was all sort of through this moment of an education. So education, an education lens got the doors open and then a lot of stuff happened, which really sort of transformed. And there's a whole chapter to talk about this project, which is how all this work has informed um, the, the next phase that Mary Beck have um, committed to, but I'm not gonna go there today because it's not enough time. We called this space, this is one of the bit at the back, this is called the autodidact's yard. So we were just really interested in questioning um, self-learning and, and learning through doing. And then I guess one thing we do, which is because we love, we love these buildings, and they're often they're often they're often sort of long-term relationships that we that we sort of that we enter. And 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 Joe and I genuinely talk about love in our practice a lot um, with these sites. And um, a lot of that is when, like, so Mary Beck will come to us and be like, oh, can you just tell us what you're doing? Or, like, give us something and explain this so we can show the mayor, or, you know. But we often kind of push this back into the site. So there's lots of examples in our practice where we kind of, I, I mean, there's people in, there's theorists that call this site writing, and I, I probably should get a bit more versed in all that. But we kind of, this is my version of site writing. It's kind of writing on sites. Um, I've really got to read that book, but anyway, it's on the list. Um, so yeah, and then it isn't empty ever again. I guess that's the kind of, that's where it lands. And I just thought just quickly, this is really funny. This is the old boys' toilets and I just thought I'd sh sort of show you this. It's really a little thing, but it's just our, our design process in this moment of collaboration. So we had um, Dale once again working on this project and we had Tama, who's this an amazing screen printer. We share this site with Black Dot Gallery, which is a contemporary First Nations gallery um, in Marybeck Council. And, it's been a really, um, a really important collaboration with Kimba Thompson there, and one of her artists, Tama, really wanted to get into this. Really wanted was doing a lot of screen printing. So we had this old boys' toilet in the um, building that hadn't been used. So we thought, okay, let's turn it into a print room. So the first thing was we removed the toilet. So there were no drawings done. That's what I'm trying to say. It's really exciting. <laughs> Didn't have to draw anything. Um, but then we started to write onto the walls. So Tama went in. Um, and turned the urinals into a place for the screen prints and started and just started using the room and then started marking it up. And we would come in and Dale would come in, we'd have a coffee. We were never like formal meetings. We'd just bump into each other and go in and, and Tama would mark up the room. So they'd be like, really need a bag hook here or this is a really good spot for here. And then these sort of beautiful drawings would come into the project. Oh, this, yeah, so then, then Tama would start to sort of draw onto the wall. So this, this, this room kind of just came out of this, this exchange and this collaboration with Tama and with, with Dale, who was our first contra. We ended up having about 30 contras on the site and that really also did bolster the community as well and really got people invested in sort of a sense of ownership of the site. So that was fun design something without doing drawings. That's good. It's okay, so, and finally, I just thought I'd show this. Um, this was another response to Mary Beck Council about sort of like, how are you learning from what you're doing and how do we fold this in? And this was um, given to the lovely Victoria who's here um, as part of our, us trying to explain um, what, we, what we are doing as well. So these are, I guess, our operations, our design and operations principles that guided the project. And these were written after the, so while we were in the project, not before the project. So I think there's also something there about learning through doing, not preempting what you're going to do. So the, these were just put around the set. And then we also wrote a, a caretaker's maintenance manifesto, which we would put up. And this was often um, read when we were feeling a bit overwhelmed by the amount of cleaning that we tend to do as part of our job. Finally, the quarry. <laughs> So those two projects were for, for local government and, oh, sorry, state government and local government. And there was always, even though these, these projects have all been going on for years, um, and I guess the thing that was really, the thing that's been really weird about working in this space and that's been quite um, unpredictable is that we would never get more than a 12-month contract. So it was this kind of real frustration. It was a, like a, fa like we're, we're practice and Joe and I are partners in, in life and work and, you know, so much frustration just in not being able to kind of, not that we were sort of beholden to a five-year trajectory or a 10-year trajectory, but we really wanted to sort of plan and see out of this really temporary way of working and not see out of it, but see how it could genuinely be sustainable. All too often it's kind of the launch pad into something else, but we really wanted to sort of sink our teeth into something that had a, had a different kind of time span. So we started looking around and we found a quarry um, and we purchased the quarry. You know, if you think about that um, film, then I bought a zoo or something, let's feel like that. But um, so <laughs> it was really cheap. <laughs> I'll just preface all this with that. Um, uh, so this is in the Otways. If we look here, we've got Apollo Bay down here. 
and we've got Colac here. So we're kind of bang in the middle and we're on the ridge line. So one thing that was really important to us for this kind of the longevity of this project was rainfall. So we were looking in regions that, that, that weren't going to be um, significantly affected by drought over the next um, 50 to 100 years. So this was a really, um, this is a really interesting point. We're in the highest rainfall in Victoria here. Um, we weren't specifically looking here, but uh, yeah, it was quite important for us to think about that. Um, yeah, because it's, a, a, I guess, a reality that we're all, or the, our next generations are going to be living with. So we are in Beach Forest, um, and this is the quarry. And the quarry is um, an old sandstone quarry, and it's been a quarry for over 150 years. So it's inextricably linked to deforestation of the Otways and to um, colonisation of this whole area. So this was sort of settler territory where people were coming in, being given parcels of land and trying, to, trying desperately to make a living off them and I guess under the guise of, of Terra Nullius. So this site's got a really complex history and it's also got a kind of complex future because we are working and in terms of then I guess the brief here and the site and the brief and how we're kind of responding to the brief, um, we are working within a rehabilitation plan. So we're working with state government. We are, it's, a pro, it's a private project but we are um, beholden to this quite sort of um, rigorous processes to do with rehabilitating quarry and mine sites. So the material um, became worthless pretty much, well, to, in an economic sense, it became worthless about um, 15 years ago when the classification for road base was changed. So it went from being a road base material to being kind of like at best a nice landscape material for some rocks on the site. It really, it, the, 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 econ the economics really fell out of this project and that's why we were able um, we were able to purchase it at the time because there was no one actually interested in quarrying or mining it profitably. It's a really beautiful stone. It's what's called Arcos sandstone. So it's, it's um, volcanic, but it's sedimentary. It's, it's been sedimentary more recently than it's been volcanic. Um, so it's this kind of soft, brittle stone. Um, if, you go, if you're familiar with the Great Ocean Road, the archway, the Great Ocean Road archway and the stone at the bottom, that's from this quarry. So there's a, the quarry's been used both on roads throughout the whole area, the first roads into this area, um, but also then a lot of kind of funny projects around the region. So it's really interesting. And I guess the first thing we did um, was think about how we can work with the rehabilitation plan. So this being this kind of, this, this thing that was kind of governing the whole project, what we really started to do was leverage that. So one of the core things back in 2017 that we started doing was um, managing blackberries. So it's this, the, one of the major parts of the, black, um, the, the quarry is um, the, the blackberry growth and then the blackberry is kind of doing something, it's stabilising the rock faces. So removing the blackberry is, causes other problems. So we started doing things like running blackberry harvests where we'd invite an artist or a, a researcher in, we'd take a group away, we'd harvest blackberries, we'd talk about blackberries, we'd kind of build culture around the problem, I guess is what, how we began this problem, we began with this project. So it's been five years. We we're really lucky to receive a grant at the end of last year um, and that's enabled us to run our first summer camps. So the idea is that we're, we're setting this project up uh, for uh, the, long, the long run and um, we're, we're building some buildings there that will accommodate all this stuff in a, in a more temporary way. But in the same way that we did at Testing Grounds with that first kind of um, pallet world and with SiteWorks that's now iterating into the future of that site, we're sort of running projects here and programs here that are, um, that are intending to sort of inform the long-term future of this site. So I talked about the blackberries, but um, what I guess we're really interested in here is in, it, it being a, research, a, a place of research, people coming into this rehabilitation plan, people coming into the problem of the site and starting to really think about um, how it can be a place of learning and how it can be a place of, of expanded practice. Um, and how instead of, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a classic thing that happens with quarries and mine sites is that they get, once they're expended, once the material's all taken, they either get uh, flooded with water or they get filled with rubbish and capped. And generally the idea is that that happens as quickly as possible. So um, 
the faster it happens, the better. That's the kind of metric. But I guess we are interested in expanding this rehabilitation plan and sort of working in the rehabilitation plan in, in, in a way. There's nothing that tells you how you have to rehabilitate a site. There's, it's really interesting. You kind of find these, not loopholes, but you find these kind of grey zones. It's fascinating. So we're trying to work into these grey zones and uh, find... Um, find a long-term vision for this site that questions the fill or flood approach. These are all the, we, so we built temporary structures for this camp. There's a, few, there's a few happy campers in the audience. It's really nice that you're here. Um, so we built temporary structures and uh, we cooked and we had, I don't know, what did we do? It was wild, it was heaps of fun. Um, and we did it twice, we did, we did run two camps back to back. And I just thought I'd um, mention here because it is kind of relevant to um, architecture. So you're probably all familiar with the architecture pavilions that get built out the back of the NGV every year, these kind of extraordinary opportunities for often emerging architects. So there's a problem that the NGV have in that they don't have anything to do with that material at the end of those projects. So for the far past five years, we've been taking all that material to the quarry and I guess building a library of materials for future use. And it's kind of interesting because we don't, we don't explicitly know what we're going to do with it, but we, we guarantee them that it's going to be used for learning and education. It's going to have a second life. The first thing that we were told to do was definitely, we were like, don't put a car park in the middle of your quarry. <laughs> that was the, the, 26, uh, the 2016 West yet with the original car park was the one, first one we got. Um, so we weren't allowed to re restage the car park, but we've been using that material ever since in lots of ways. So this is, um, this is Addition Office's beautiful in absence um, piece. <laughs> Uh, this screening here is, um, is the steel frames. Um, this um, stainless steel here on the kitchen bench is from the car wash. Um, yeah, so we're, we're slowly, this, all this um, amazing LVL, like this seriously an amazing amount of material that we've got. The problem is with these pavilions, and, and I guess just a, a thought here that I, it's important, I think, as, as people that build things in the world, is how things come apart is something I think we all need to think a lot more about. We spend hundreds of hours re-delaminating material because it's been really bad, really quickly glued together. So the eco economics of pavilions and temporary architecture often mean that this stuff is really difficult to give a second life to. But we've got time and we've got space at the quarry and we've got a long time and a lot of space. So pulling these pavilions apart and making that material useful for the long run for new projects is um, something we've committed to. Uh, doings and all these structures have been put together in ways there there is the material there lots of the material in waiting um, and, the, and a lot of our temporary structures are very ad hoc and built very quickly um, they've all they're all able to be re-pulled apart and I think it was just kind of nice this little moment we had some um, some people there that were water planners that did a lot of stuff with um, um, water systems and they'd never actually done anything with water they, they all the drawings and engineering around water systems and filtering water in, in developing countries. And they took out the little kitchen, the little canteen that didn't really have much connection to, we were just kind of letting the water um, disperse off the ground. They started kind of connecting to the kitchen and building a, a rain garden. And so these little sort of pods on the site almost had little un, un, sort of un, unfinished ends, or like the services were all a bit loose and people throughout the camp started kind of clipping and adding their ideas and adding their sort of adding projects to them. So I just think that's a kind of, it's a, it's a drawing that I should probably do. Um, yeah. So that was just a little, the little pavilion in the, and the, um, where we had dinner each night. And I guess just to end, I have this kind of thing that I've been thinking about that, and I hope, hope I've sort of what I've been trying to say tonight is that architecture is not a thing. I guess I'm interested in thinking about architecture as latent, as provisional, and architecture being agency. Um, yeah, and that's me. Thank you.